Hi class. In this recording, we're going to focus on how we can take a photon of light and use those photons of light to form an image. So as we look at light, that light will pass through the, the cornea and the anterior chamber and ultimately make its way to the lens. When light gets to the lens in our eye, it's going to be inverted through the lens and then sent back to the retina. And our mind will automatically revert that image so that it's right side up. As we look at the iris or the, the iris of our eye that controls the opening of the pupil, there are two sets of muscles within the iris. We're going to have a sphincter or circular muscle, and that's going to be a parasympathetic muscle. It causes our pupils to constrict so that we let less light in, and we do that in response to bright lights. We also have a pupillary dilator muscle. And this pupillary dilator muscle is going to be associated with the sympathetic nervous system. And these muscle fibers pull the iris so that the pupil is enlarged. And this allows for more light to enter into our eyeballs. Uh, this will typically be activated in a dim light or low light environment. Now, as we're looking at the pupillary constriction dilation, this is going to be influenced by light intensity. Another thing that is going to influence it is at what we look at. As we look at things that are far away at, or versus nearby, we're going to in, um, change the opening of our pupil. The photopupillary reflex, as its name implies, photo referring to light, pupillary referring to the pupil, and reflex, meaning it happens automatically, is constriction of the pupil in response to light. And that there's an autonomic nervous system reflex arc that re regulates this. Bright lights are going to signal the pretectal region of the midbrain. This will excite the parasympathetic fibers in our ocular motor nerve. And then that will travel to the ciliary ganglion, ganglion with an orbit and cause the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers to constrict the eye. This is a defense mechanism. If we get too much light, too bright of light getting into our eye, we have our vision wash out and we can have potential damage to the retina. As we're looking at light, something that happens to light as it's moving through the parts of our eyes is that it's bent. This process of bending light is referred to as refraction. So as we bend light, light will change path of travel. Now in a vacuum, light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. That's pretty standard. But depending on the medium it's traveling through, if it's not in a vacuum, the light tends to slow down. So if we have light traveling through air, water, glass, or anything else, it travels at different speeds, and this change in speed of light causes the light to reflect, or, or refract, I should say, or bend. The refractive index of a medium is a measure of how much the, the medium retards light or slows down light relative to air at sea level, standard temp and pressure. Now, if we look at the angle of incidence, at 90 degrees, our angle of incidence will slow light but not change direction. At any other angle of incidence, though, we're going to see a change in the direction of light. And the greater the refractive index, the greater the change in the angle of uh, the greater the refractive index and or the greater the angle of incidence, the more refraction we're going to occur. So as we look at this cup, if we look right at the dead center of the cup, right here, the angle of incidence is 90 degrees exactly, and there is zero refraction. But if we look over here, the farther off to the side we go, the far the more refraction we're going to have within our cup. Now, as we have light passing through the optical components of our eyes, let's look at the refractive index. Air has a refractive index of 1, by definition. Our lens of our eye is 1.4. Cornea is 1.38. Aqueous humor is 1.33. And the vitreous body, or vitreous humor, is also 1.33. 
So as we're looking at the aqueous humor and lens, this aqueous humor and lens are designed in such a way that they have almost no impact on the path of light. Our cornea, though, as we look at it, has a refractive index of 1.38, and in particular, because of the high degree of curvature to our cornea, our cornea is going to refract more light than the lens. Our lens is going to focus on fine-tuning the images. As we're looking at our lens, it becomes rounder to increase refraction so that we can have better focus on things that are near. When things are close to us, and I'll, let me clear the screen here, for objects that are close, um, let's say this object is right here, it can have photons of light traveling in multiple different directions as they hit the eye. So to accommodate for those different directions of travel, the lens needs to become rounder. If something's very far away, let's say from off screen, it could be like the blue arrows, and that by the time they get to that little tiny, the photons get to that little tiny pupil, those photons are traveling all nearly parallel to each other. So the lens doesn't have to refract those photons of light for far objects as much as they do, as the lens does near objects. As we're looking at our eyes and our responses to vision, the near response um, can be referred to as N-metropia. N-metropia is when our eye is relaxed and focused on something that's more than six meters away. Light coming from that object that's more than six meters away is going to have essentially parallel paths of travel for those photons of light. And those rays can hit the retina without effort. It's really easy for us to look at those objects. And then objects that are closer to the retina or from a closer than six meters have divergent photons and we need to try to look at them. They are too divergent for us to focus on them unless we have some kind of effort put into bending and flexing our cilia, excuse me, our lens using the suspensory ligaments and the ciliary muscles so that we can refocus on that near object. So how do we focus on something that's close? First, we move our eyeballs so that they can look at something that's close. What do we do next? We then are going to constrict the pupil. And by constricting the pupil, we are going to make it so that the photons of light that get into our eye are going to be more likely to be traveling parallel. If I have a large opening, I can have photons of light traveling multiple directions through that large opening. And if I have a small opening, the photons of light that are highly divergent never get into the opening. And typically it's the photons that are traveling relatively close together or relatively parallel that make it to the opening. So we first change the, the direction that we're looking at, or the direction of what we're looking at. We also are then going to constrict our pupils. And then finally, we need to accommodate the lens. We need to change the curvature of our lens. So the ciliary muscles are going to contract, the suspensory ligaments will slacken, and the lens takes on a convex or thicker shape. So our lens becomes more oblong or thicker. And that thicker lens is going to cause more refraction. It's going to cause those photons of light that may be traveling at an oblique angle to hit the lens and then be more likely to be refocused to the macula lutea and fovea centralis. Our near point of vision is the closest an object can be to us and still come into focus. Um, as we age, the near point of vision increases. So when we're young, we can hold something right up into the front of our face. And my kids, you know, my, I have a little kids right now, they're super young. When they want me to see something, they hold it an inch or two away from my face. <laughs> I'm sorry, but my eyes aren't that young anymore and I can't see anything that close to my face. So then I have to grab their hands and I, I call it the trombone motion. I kind of go woo, 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 like I'm playing a trombone and 
hold it out farther away from me so that it's at my near point of vision and I can still see it. So as I'm testing it right now, and I know you can't see me, I'm in my recording mode on the screen. Um, my near point of vision is about four to five inches right now. So it's getting bigger as I get older. Ugh, crud. Anyways, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them on the class discussion board or shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.